So in this lecture, <coughs> we're going to go over the fundamentals of biochemical engineering as well as uh, the fundamentals of yield, which are, is an important concept in uh, bioprocessing and biochemical engineering. So the goals for this lecture are first to understand that the primary goal of biochemical engineers is to change the phenotype of a population of cells in a fermentation, i.e. produce a product. Understand that some primary tools of biochemical engineers are genetic engineering tools, molecular biology. Understand the important rates of uh, concepts of rate, titer, and yield, which are the key outputs and metrics of a fermentation. Understand the basics of microbial growth. Uh, understand the yield basics. So understand that biomass is a necessary byproduct in fermentation processes that reduce overall yield. Uh, understand the concept of a yield coefficient and understand how to calculate maximum theoretical yields using material and energy balances. Understand that reactions that generate uh, the reactions in biology that generate usable energy as ATP, and understand the reactions that generate usable electrons for biosynthesis. Well, you'll need those reactions later to do mass and energy balance, material and energy balances for potential products. So to start with, the goals of biochemical engineers are really to manipulate genetic information or the genotype of a cell in order to affect changer changes to the behavior or properties of those cells, i.e. the phenotype. So we're manipulating genotype to affect the phenotype. And there are three common types of phenotypes that are engineered by biochemical engineers. The first would be physiologic. So those would be, for example, tolerance to a molecule or other non-metabolic characteristics of um, a phenotype. Maybe you want a green cell, for example. Uh, and then there are metabolic or catabolic, which would be new metabolic or catabolic capabilities, i.e. Um, eating new carbon sources, consuming cellulosic sugars, bioremediation of toxic compounds. And then population-based, uh, which would be production in a fermentation of a molecule of interest. It could be a protein, um, if it could be a therapeutic, it could be a small molecule, etc. The primary goal of biochemical engineers is to make products via fermentation, right? So we go from a large scale industrial fermentation, it could be a pharmaceutical fermentation, it could be industrial fermentation, to a cell culture, where we have uh, individual cells that we can then modify the enzymes in these cells to affect the behavior back up to the fermentation vessels. So biochemical engineers essentially engineer cells by changing genes, and specifically metabolic engineers engineer cells by modifying enzyme levels and enzyme networks. Metabolic engineers use genetic engineering technologies to do this. So we basically edit the DNA and mRNA to affect the enzymes and the enzyme networks to affect the cell population behavior, uh, to affect the outputs in cell culture, and then into industrial fermentation. In this course, in this course, the word fermentation um, is going to be not limited to fermentative metabolism. So although Fermentation is often generically used for both anaerobic and aerobic processes, anaerobic being without oxygen, aerobic being with oxygen. There is a type of metabolism called fermentative metabolism, which would be like, for example, um, uh, beer production or wine production, which happens without uh, oxygen. And we're going to use the word fermentation more generally here to refer to both aerobic and anaerobic uh, processes. So production in a fermentation uh, is... Uh, has a time course, um, and this would be an example time course of uh, product formation in the ABE fermentation, which would be acetone, butanol, ethanol fermentation. This would be a clostridial based process. Um, this process, for example, was used back in World War II in uh, the UK to generate uh, jet fuel when they were cut off from the continent. Um, and this is a clostridial process where the cells grow and they make a mixture of products, including acetone, butanol, butyric acid. So as a, these products can be measured as a function of time. Um, in addition, uh, the biomass or optical density levels can be measured as a function of time, which is this uh, starred curve, as well as the concentration of the sugar that we fed into the fermentation, which is the glucose. And you can also measure fermentation parameters such as oxygen concentration, pH, etc. There are three primary metrics to assess the fermentation of any desired product, and those are rate, titer, and yield, RTY. Rate is gram per liter per hour, or basically amount of product per volume per time. Titer is the fancy name for concentration, so gram per liter. And yield would be the gram or amount of product per the amount of feedstock fed in. And you can calculate these most times based off of simple analysis of fermentation data. So in this case, we have a final butanol titer of 10 gram per liter. Butanol is the white square. As time goes on, it accumulates to a final titer of 10 gram per liter, a final concentration of 10 gram per liter. The average butanol production rate is 0.11 gram per liter per hour. So that's basically taken as the 
average would be the tighter at the end divided by the total time, right? So it'd be 10 divided by 90 hours, which is uh, 0.11. The final butanol yield can be calculated when you take this data along with the glucose data from the previous slide. So from the previous slide, the glucose concentration started at around 60 grams per liter. Assuming this is a batch uh, fermentation where the glucose was all added up front and that glucose wasn't added during the process, uh, we say that we started with 60 grams of glucose uh, per liter and we ended up with 10 grams per liter of uh, butanol and that gives us a yield of 0.16. Of course, this doesn't account for potential volume changes, which you would need to consider if you were doing an accurate yield calculation. One of the interesting things about fermentations is that they necessitate cells, right? So they are using cells um, in bioconversions or in biosynthesis to produce different products. And so biomass levels or the numbers of cells in fermentations can vary greatly. Cell densities can range from very low levels, one gram dry cell weight per liter um, to over 50. Gram dry cell weight, which is gram dry cell weight, is basically the weight of cells without water. Um, uh, high cell density fermentations are usually considered to be when cell concentrations are above 50 grams dry cell weight, but this is somewhat of an arbitrary uh, cutoff. And high cell densities, really high cell densities, 100, 200 grams dry cell weight per liter can be very viscous due to these high biomass levels. And if aeration is required, this can be really expensive. In the literature, you may also see grams dry cell weight referred to as cell dry weight, gram cell dry weight, and they're basically equivalent. And these cells require feedstock. So biomass growth requires sugars um, or other feedstocks so that cells can eat and multiply, divide, and produce products. So cells have to eat. Other required nutrients besides sugars or other feedstocks would include ammonium for protein synthesis, some source of ammonium, phosphate for nucleotide synthesis, sulfur, salts, trace metals for enzymes and cofactors, etc. For microbial cells, approximately 35 to 60 percent of the dry cell weight is protein. Right? So a good rule of thumb here would be that 50% of the gram dry cell weight is protein, 30% is lipid, 20% is nucleic acids. Um, biomass can also be summarized, uh, and this has been experimentally determined, as a chemical formula with a particular stoichiometry. So for example, E. coli biomass, when it's grown on glucose, has the formula C3.85, H6.69, O1.778, and N1. A yield factor for any nutrient can be experimentally determined as well. So for example, one gram dry cell weight would require two grams of glucose, and we'll talk more about yield coefficients later. Uh, biomass growth and fermentation usually follows, uh, in a, not just fermentation, in any culture system, usually follows an exponential or monad growth model or a logistic model, which we will tend to use later in the course. An exponential growth model is pretty simple. The cells start off at one number. They have a lag period where they're adjusting to the new media conditions. Then they start to double. So one cell becomes two, two cells becomes four. Um, that's the exponential phase. When they begin to consume most of the nutrients and there's a limiting nutrient or um, condition that's limiting growth rate, they start to settle off into something called stationary phase. This can be exponential growth can be modeled, at least this part of the growth can be modeled as n, the number of cells, equals the starting point, e to the mu t, where mu is the growth rate, t is the time, and you can calculate the doubling time from the growth rate um, via the natural log of 2, which is 0.69. So doubling time is 0.69 divided by mu. Non-exponential growth, such as stationary phase, is caused by limitation in one or more nu required nutrients. Um, which could include oxygen um, or something else that's delivered into the system that's not in the media. Biomass correlations, this is actually really important for your lab portions of the course. Um, biomass, biomass levels are routinely measured using absorbance. So you'll use a spectrophotometer. Many of you may have done this where you measure the amount of cells around by measuring the absorbance at 600 nanometers, for example. And so it's important to, to know that there's a, generally a correlation between that reading and the gram cell dry weight um, that you actually have in a, in a culture. So for many microbes, and you can use this throughout this course, one absorbance unit at 600 nanometers is equal to 0.35 gram cell dry weight or dry cell weight per liter. So if you had one liter of um, OD1 culture, you would have 0.35 grams of cells. Biomass, as we mentioned, is also a chemical. So this would be E. coli, um, and it has a formula when grown in glucose media of, of carbon 3.85, hydrogen 6.69, oxygen 1.78, nitrogen 1. And we use that chemical formula when we start to calculate yields. And we're going to go into the basics of yield now. 
So yield calculations are basic stoichiometry um, and they're basic material and energy balances. So if you haven't uh, reviewed the video on material and energy balances, I would recommend doing that before going further into this video. So for E. coli biomass, we can basically say that we're taking sugar as the carbon source and ammonia as a nitrogen source, and we can convert those into E. coli, which is the chemical formula here. We can basically balance this equation, and we get 0.64 moles of sugar plus one mole of ammonia equals one mole of biomass and some water. And that would be the ideal um, yield of biomass from sugar um, in this purely uh, material balance um, analysis. So we'd have point, we'd have basically uh, molecular weight of sugar is 181 grams per mole. The molecular weight of biomass is 95.37 grams per mole. We can put together a yield equation where we have one mole of biomass, 0.64 moles of glucose per 0.64 moles of glucose uh, times the molecular weight of biomass divided by the molecular weight of the feedstock. And that gives us a yield coefficient of 0.82 grams of E. coli per gram of glucose. That, again, is the yield coefficient would be defined as the gram of anything per the gram of feedstock. So the gram of any product or byproduct um, per gram of feedstock would be a yield coefficient. And in this case, the product or byproduct is cells or biomass. So with this analysis, we get a theoretical maximum yield coefficient of 0.82. Um, yields can be characterized by these yield coefficients and can be either calculated based on models or experimentally measured. So sometimes experimentally measuring them is a little more useful. A biomass yield coefficient is re relates the amount of nutrients food required for the production of a given amount of biomass. You can have a yield coefficient for ammonia. You can have a yield coefficient for glucose. You can have a yield coefficient for oxygen. And for example, a typical yield coefficient for E. coli grown aerobically on glucose is 0.5. This would be an experimentally measured yield coefficient. And this means that for every one gram of glucose, you make 0.5 grams of E. coli cells. So we calculated 0.82. So what are we missing? Uh, we need to balance both the materials, which is what we've done in the first uh, few slides, but as well as the energy, which is what we're missing. So the balanced equation above takes into account a material balance, um, and so it is a balanced equation, but it is not energy balanced. So if we look at the free energy balance of this equation, and we look at the free energy of the products, um, which would be biomass and water, uh, and the free energy of the substrates, which would be glucose and ammonia, and we do a um, balance of this equation, we end up with a net positive free energy of, of 89.05 kilojoules per mole, right? So if you remember your chemistry, things that are positive free energy are not spontaneous reactions, right? So this is not going to be a viable synthesis for E. coli when it's a positive free energy reaction. So how do cells get energy aerobically? We have to add extra energy into the system to get the cells to grow. And they get this from the oxidation of sugar, right? So they take sugar and oxygen and they generate energy in the form of ATP and wastewater. Um, this reaction, if you completely burn glucose, has a, a very negative free energy of uh, about 3,000 kilojoules per mole. But cells are not able to capture all this energy. Cells don't basically burn, literally burn sugar. Um, they convert the sugar into usable energy in the form of ATP. So sugar plus oxygen plus phosphate plus the reduced energy ADP is converted to ATP water and heat along with carbon dioxide. If you took this ATP, so one mole of sugar at most can make 36 moles of ATP. This is a sort of optimized aerobic metabolism. If you took one ATP and you use the energy um, going backwards to make ADP, you would get 30 kilojoules per mole of energy out of the hydrolysis of one molecule of, of one mole of ATP. And so 36 of those would equal about a thousand kilojoules per mole. So if, they, if cells were able to use all of the energy from ATP, which they are not, um, at best case, they would be able to, to use 38%, uh, 1,099 divided by 287, of the amount of energy that's available in sugar if you were to completely burn it. And so that would be a maximum theoretical energy efficiency of 38%. But as I mentioned, E. coli or other microbes, or even any cell for that matter, is not 100% efficient at even using the energy from ATP. And estimates on this efficiency vary greatly. However, it's safe to assume that biological systems can really only use 25 to 40% of, of the energy in ATP when it's hydrolyzed. And so if we assume 40%, we can update our calculations. Right. So we take our material balance, which we had before, 
we now add our energy balance where we need to have an extra 89 kilojoules per mole of energy to be able to produce the cells. Uh, we can get that energy from the oxidation of glucose to the formation of ATP. Right? But we have to account for the fact that of this energy that is uh, available in the ATP, we only use 40% of it. So we need 89 and we only get 40% of the 1100. And so we need 0.2 uh, moles of glucose burned in this case to be able to generate the 89 kilojoules of, uh, per mole of, AT of energy needed to, to have the biosmass synthesis be a net negative free energy or at least a zero free energy. So if we oxidize and consume 0.2 moles of glucose, we would get this equation, which gives us oxygen and glucose gives us CO2 and water. And we can add that, which is the energy generating part of metabolism, to the material balance part of metabolism. And we get an updated equation where we have 0.84 moles of sugar required per mole of E. coli biomass. So we can update our yield co coefficients. So we get now one mole of E. coli biomass per 84 moles of glucose the molecular weight of E. coli, the molecular weight of glucose. And we have a yield coefficient of 0.62 now, grams of E. coli per gram of glucose. And that gives us a maximal theoretical yield, yield coefficient of 0.62 uh, based on a estimate of the energy efficiency of ATP utilization. So practically, I said that the yield coefficient for E. coli grown aerobically on glucose is 0 0.8, 0 0.5. So that means for every gram of glucose, you can make 0.5 grams of E. coli. So this, how close is this to theoretical? So a theoretical maximum based on material and energy balances around 0.6. Uh, we can, uh, in ideal cases, get 0.5. So we can get 80% of theoretical, which is pretty good. Um, many gro cultures that you would uh, grow in the lab will be much less than 0.5. Um, that would be more of an optimal fermentation condition that would get you a 0.5 yield coefficient. And this analysis can be done for any given biological process. So we've, we, we went through how you can calculate this for biomass, converting the feedstocks into biomass. We have to take into account a material balance as well as an energy balance. But the same math, math and the same balance can be done for any product, whether the product is a large protein that has a chemical formula that you can define or a small molecule that has a chemical formula that you can define. Um, as well as any particular byproducts. And so for all products and byproducts, a material and energy balance can be used to calculate the theoretical maximum yield. So for biomass production, taking into account the material balance and the free energy balance, we have the final equation below. That would be the maximum theoretical yield of biomass from sugar. And as I mentioned, you're never really going to be operating at that. You may be at 75, 80% best case of the maximum theoretical yield. We also can think about generically, how do we get energy? We talked about this for biomass, but you may need energy to be generated for any product you may wanna make. For example, proteins are highly energy dependent. So to make a protein, you may need a lot of glucose to be burned to generate a lot of ATP. And we talked about how um, the energy recovery from ATP is 30.5 kilojoules per mole. Um, and assuming only 40% of this energy is captured by biosynthesis, um, we can assume that we have an equation like this, that when you're getting usable energy, one mole of glucose is converted to 36 ATP, and the usable energy is 439 kilojoules per mole. Um, we also can look at the biological production of reducing equivalents. So um, we talked about um, the complete oxidation of glucose to carbon dioxide and water, um, but we also know that water is basically, um, can be formed from hydrogen and oxygen. And this is actually what biology does. So biology is actually, this complete oxidation in a biological system is actually the sum of the oxidation of hydrogen at the expense of oxygen to generate water and the, the breaking apart of sugar into carbon dioxide and hydrogens. So you may not know them as hydrogen gas, but in biological systems, these would be the cofactors NADH, NADPH, and FAD. So bio, biological um, systems, including meta metabolic systems, basically strip the electrons off of sugar, generating uh, metabolites and carbon dioxide and electrons that are uh, usable in the form of NADH. Right? But if you need to generate extra electrons because your product happens to be more reduced, having more electron density than glucose, this would be the equation that you would use. So you can generate extra electrons just like you can generate extra ATP to drive your reaction when you basically consider that glucose can be basically ox um, converted into carbon dioxide and, and water at this uh, delta free energy. So that will end this lecture on uh, basics of yield, um, as well as the introduction to biochemical engineering. And our next lecture will be um, going into fundamentals of rate.